June, you've had a, a wonderfully long career in comics since since the 1980s, and you've you've worked on a wide variety of titles: Power Pack, Star Wars, um, Supergirl, recently Captain Ginger, which is very exciting. Can you tell me, when you were younger, what was it that interested you in comics in the first place, and and got you to even think about it as a possibility for a career? Well, when I was really young, I, I didn't think about comics. I, I knew I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be a professional artist. I wanted to make money, um, but I never gave comics a thought. I didn't read comics when I was a, a kid. I wasn't forbidden to or anything, it's just, um, you know, uh, I wasn't really interested. It was mostly superhero comics. And I, I think had I found a comic book about a girl and her horse and her cat, <laughs> I, you know, I would have I would have read that, but I didn't know of anything. Okay. Like that. Um, I didn't know about comics until I met my, um, my boyfriend, who's now my husband, Roy Richardson, who was a, a big comic book nerd, uh, big collection, uh, followed the artists and, uh, I, I honestly can't remember ever reading a comic book before I met him. I read comic strips in the newspaper, but I never read comic books. And um, I was uh, starting college at that point, starting uh, U college at UGA. And I knew I wanted to major in art, but I, I really didn't know what direction to go in. And so he showed me some of his, um, I think it was Jack Kirby Fourth World comics. Wow. Uh, new gods and I uh, it was just like getting sucked through a interdimensional warp or something I just remember just being pulled into those pages and that artwork and and uh, then I, I think the next step was he, he took me to a comic book convention in Atlanta and I met artists and saw them working and I thought wow, I, I really like to draw. These people like to draw, they draw really well. And they're doing, I, they were doing these amazing drawings with no reference, no models, but they were totally believable, dynamic. Um, and that just, I've always liked drawing and that really appealed to me and that, that was the spark. Was your mother or father into arts in any way, shape or form? Was there a proclivity for it in your family? No, no. I think if there's a proclivity to anything, it's focus, um, the ability to uh, get almost like tunnel vision focus on, on what we're doing. My, my brother and sister and father all had that ability and that comes in really handy when you're, when you're drawing comics. So I, I wanted to draw comics uh, when I was a kid. I did interview at Marvel and I did work there for about a week until they fired me because I wasn't very fast. So it was my, <laughs> I was way too detailed. And, and this leads me to my, uh, my next question. I went to art school at uh, the University of Florida and it was a traditional art program with a really good printmaking and a really good painting department, but it didn't have any, any focus on any kind of applied arts like illustration or, or comics. And I imagine the same must have been true when you originally went to the University of Georgia. So what did you study there? Uh, you know, I went through the, the core program my freshman year, um, you know, figure drawing, uh, color theory. Um, I, 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 well, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, you know, the basic core stuff, they did, I believe they did have a focus on illustration there. Um, I had an instructor and in one of the core, like, basic drawing classes that, was very helpful and that he he made us keep a sketchbook with like we had to do 50 sketches a week in the sketchbook and at first everybody was killing themselves because they were trying to do all this 
you know, modeling and rendering and hatching and blah, 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 blah. And he finally said, just make everything something. Just mm. make everything something. And I started doing these drawings. He compared it to Decherico, I think, which were just these simple, simple line drawings. But you could point to everything in that drawing and say, well, this is a wall, this is a chair, this is a desk, this is a sky. Everything was something. And in, in hindsight, that was really helpful. Um, you weren't just, you know, because in, in comic books, everything is something. You're not just drawing a flower floating in space. You have to define your space, define the space the characters are in, not just the characters. So I wish I could remember his name. I want to say it was Olson, Ollie Olson. Um, but that was, that was very helpful. Uh, but there was no concentration in, in sequential art at, at, at school back then. I think there was a, the Joe Kubert School had opened up in Dover, New Jersey, New Jersey, but that was about it as far as as far as comics and sequential art. Well, absolutely, and so that was a highly specialized proprietary program, and so. Uh, you were impressed by the people who were working at this particular convention and it inspired you. Your boyfriend had a collection of, of good work. And I think we're about the same age, obviously. The Jack Kirby influence grabbed me. I remember going every, every week to the local drugstore where once a week, they had a new shipment of comics coming in and, and getting everything that I could possibly consume at that time. And, and uh, his work was certainly dynamic. And it's what prompted me to want to go into at least illustration as a career. So how did you initially get your foot in the door? You went to the Kubert School, did you not? No, I didn't. I, I, you didn't? I, uh... I actually dropped out of school um, and started working on a portfolio and just looking at other comic book artists. I mean, I had some background figure drawing. I knew some perspective. I started studying artists that I, I liked. Um, at this convention I went to, I met Bernie Wrightson and I met Gil Kane. And, um, I, I started looking at them. Those were, were two of my favorites and just worked up a, a little portfolio. And um, oh gosh, I, I did some work. I was, had, did some published work for a very small comic book company in Florida um, owned by a guy named Bill Black who, who gave uh, quite a few artists a, a start. And so I had something in print and then I, I got a little job for DC for, they had a new talent showcase book of unpublished artists and writers. And I did a little job for that. And the, the guy who wrote it, Steve Ringenberg, was working at Marvel at that time. I can't remember if it was like a secretarial position or assistant editor, but he said, hey, if you want to come up to New York and visit, I can get you in the door. And that really? was- got my foot in the door. You could do that then. <laughs> you could know somebody that would get you in and you would sign in at the front desk and walk around to the editor's offices and knock on the door, introduce yourself, show your portfolio, get a job. That's remarkable. And of course, that was true in the freelance illustration days. I was able to do that and able to go and, and show portfolios at a, at a time when you could call up art directors and make appointments and and get your foot in the door and make an introduction that time has vanished oh yeah really very difficult thing to do these days but um you needed the paradox was you needed to have a tear sheet you really needed to show somebody who was giving you that interview that you had been published before when you were looking for that first shot, that first chance. And that was the catch 22. You're looking for a job, but you don't have a job under your belt yet. And who's going to give you that very first break? That's a tough one. 
And so it was very fortunate that you had had that, that already printed copy of something that showed that you could meet a deadline, that you were publishable, and that, and that you had that shot. So you went to work at Marvel, and at the time that you, that you broke into the field, there cannot have been too many women working in the business. There would have been you and Louise Simonson and Marie Severin and I guess Flo Steinberg, who sort of ran, ran the shop at Marvel. And I, I had met her once when I worked there for a nanosecond, which is absolutely delightful. Um, how, how was the environment there for women creators early on when this was really an industry that seemed to be geared towards male creators? Right. Um, honestly, it was, it was very welcoming. It was very welcoming. I, I think that's not always a narrative people want to hear from me. Um, there, there weren't a lot of women in the business, but not a lot of women were really interested. I mean, you have to remember this, this was the early eighties and it was the age of the superhero. I mean, superhero right. comics were huge and getting even bigger. And there just, there weren't a lot of women writers and artists who really wanted to work. In, in that genre. Um, I, I was just interested in it from, you know, purely an artistic point of view. I just love the challenge of the drawing. And I did get into the stories. I mean, I did start reading comics. I mean, you kind of have to uh, get a feel for the stories if you're going to, um, to illustrate them. But as far as my experience, um, I, I always felt very welcome. I didn't really experience any kind of you know sexism or bias um yeah yeah it was it was it, also it was just great timing because things were really gearing up and the companies just wanted bodies to draw books so yeah. you know, that that was uh, a great opportunity for someone like me who had very little experience and very little preparation for, for that job. Did you work in the bullpen or did you work from home or how, how did you work in the early days? Uh, no, I never had the bullpen um, experience, which is too bad because it, it was pretty cool back then. You know, Marvel had this bullpen where you people were actually making comics and, you know, mostly doing, you know, um, corrections and lettering and coloring and last minute things because there was always something last minute to be done before a book went to press. But um, it was it was quite a game. Uh, but no, I, I ended up we did end up moving to New York. I, I was my husband and I um, were born and raised in Georgia, but when I started getting work, we decided to move to New York. And we, we lived, um, actually we lived just about 30 miles north of the city in White Plains. Uh, it was very expensive to live in the city and that was just a little bit too much culture shock for a girl from Georgia. So um, White Plains was, you know, that was uh, suburbs. And um, we were, we would, you know, go into the offices probably like once a week, um, usually to get a paycheck because it was yeah. very hand to mouth then. Um, and, but then we would also FedEx in our work. Um, I, I think it was, it was important at that time, even though you had FedEx, it was still important to establish yourself by living near the offices. Um, making, you know, that was where we made connections. We met other artists. We went to dinners, we went to parties, we hung out around the office and, you know, made connections that we still have today, uh, friendships and, you know, professional work connections. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it was very different then in that, you know, now, I mean, now you can live and work anywhere. And we did eventually end up moving back to Georgia. Who was the art director for, um, Marvel back when you started? That was John Romita Sr. He was mm. 
the art director. And Very nice man, I understand. I've oh, met yeah. him. Yeah, just total sweetheart, professional. I wish I had taken advantage of him being there more. I wish I would had picked his brain more and, you know, listened to him more and learned more from him. But I was just a punky kid who, you know, I already thought I knew what I was doing, which of course I didn't. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. And so um, you ended up teaming up for Power Pack with Louise Simonson, who has had a very long and well-established career, a wife of um, a great artist, Walt Simonson. But Louise is a terrific storyteller. Tell me about uh, Power Pack, how you got together and, and generated that um, creative work. Because that was really your initial. Oh yeah, yeah, that, wasn't that was just, it was honestly just serendipity. Uh, I, I met her on my first visit to Marvel and she was an editor then. I can't remember what book she was editing. But I, I went in her office and we met and I showed her my portfolio and she didn't have any work for me at the time, but that was when she, she asked me if I knew how to draw children because she had this idea for Power Pack and was having trouble finding somebody who could draw convincing children because like I said, it was the age of the superhero and you had these artists who could draw amazing, amazing big, bulky Captain America, you know, every muscle delineated superheroes, but not so much children, which is a, a whole different set of problems to be solved. Of um, course, you don't want to see a nine-year-old who is uh, overly developed. Right. <laughs> but um, what, what is it like for you to have that collaborative process of, of working with, with a writer like Louise or, or the writers with whom you work for um, your, your daily strip. Right. Um, what is that process like for you? Is it something that's a true give and take? Is it a conversation? I'm really curious. Well, I've been really fortunate to work with good writers all throughout my career. And um, I think for the most part, we, there is an interchange, there is an exchange of ideas, but I know they know what they're doing. They know I know what I'm doing. And we kind of leave each other alone. I mean, we communicate, we throw ideas in the pot, stir them around, see what happens. And then we do our thing. Um, I really like, I've always liked working with um, Louise uh, because she writes in a style that's kind of like full script, but also still like Marvel style, which is a whole other conversation about styles of writing comics. Um, Marvel style gives the artist a little more freedom in the pacing, whereas a, a writer who writes full script is more in charge of, of the pacing and the beats and the timing of the story. Um, she writes in such a way that um, I, I know exactly what she's thinking. I know what the, the characters are doing and saying and thinking, but it gives me a little more leeway in, in the pacing of the story. Um, and with the, with the comic strip with, with Mary Worth, most of the communication is done at the beginning of a story arc. And it goes something like, do you have any ideas for the next story arc? Oh, well, <laughs> let's see what we can come up with. <laughs> And, you know, the writer and I will, you know, uh, Karen Moy will, will toss some ideas around and, and, you know, finally settle on something and, and then flesh it out some more and do it. So I'm really interested in the differences between working on a comic book that would be 20 plus pages uh, and, and the demands of a daily strip. I know your husband colors the daily strip, doesn't he? And does he do lettering as well? Uh, we, we have a little cottage industry going here. I do the pencils. Uh, he does inking, lettering, and colors the Sunday page. Right. And so 
how does it work for your, for you when you're given a script, provided a script for a comic book specifically? What is your day like? Do you get that script via email, FedEx? Are you thumbnailing it? Are you submitting those? What's the day like? What's the month like? I'm really curious for our students or prospective students who might be interested in pursuing this field either for their own comics or for doing storyboards for animation studios or uh, advertising agencies. From the time you're presented a script idea through a little bit of the process in which you develop that story that ends up being that 22 page comic. Right. Um, at this stage in my career, I don't submit thumbnails or layouts. Uh, I, I get the script through email. Um, like right now I'm working on a, a, a power pack series and I get the script from Louise and I sit down and I'll, I'll read through the whole thing. And then I, because of the way she writes it now where she breaks down the story page by page, panel by panel, I thumbnail it one scene at a time. Back in the olden days when it was Marvel style, a writer would give you almost like a synopsis of the story. It wouldn't necessarily be broken down page by page, certainly not panel by panel. So you really had to sit down and thumbnail lay out the whole job to make sure you weren't gonna get to page 20 and you still have about 10 pages of story left to tell. So it was important to do the whole thing at once. But, um, Nowadays, most writers, um, most writers work full script, so they're breaking it down page by page, panel by panel. That's already pretty much decided, the pacing. So I will get the script, I will sit down, I will read the whole thing, I will thumbnail out one scene and draw it. I find it difficult, I know artists who will break down the whole story, thumbnail it, lay it out, the whole story before they go to what's called finished pencils. I find it really hard to do. Uh, the, the, the layout, the thumbnailing, that's the storytelling part of the job. It's the hardest part to me. And I just don't have like the mental artistic stamina to lay out the whole job at once. So I, I, I break it down scene by scene. And then I sit down with my pencil and my, um, you know, 11 by 17 Bristol board, and I just, I start drawing. I, I have my little scribbly thumbnails that only I can decipher. <laughs> and, right. um, but, but, you know, it, it gives me a plan. And sometimes as I'm drawing, that plan may change. I'll see something I decide to emphasize, something I'm gonna de-emphasize. Maybe I'm gonna change a camera angle here, or, you know, I'll, I'll make some variations. But I, I draw it. And then I scan in my pencils and send it to um, the writer and the editor. And they say, yeah, this looks good. And then I walk downstairs and hand the original pencils to my husband who he's, he's inking me on the power pack job and um, he inks them. And then he goes through a similar process of uh, doing digital cleanup, formatting the page to um, the printable size and proportions and um, sending it off. That's, That's it. really remarkable. And so if he's inking your work, is the, the inking being done on a Cintiq monitor or is, it, is no. he a traditional? He's old school. He's old I school. love you both. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I, Although I think it's Cintiq, marvelous. But, yeah, I, I tried to talk him into, especially on the, the comic, strip that we do because we're we have these like big rubber tubs full of comic strips i'm like you know we could do this digitally um i tried to talk him into working on the cintiq he's like ah you know all <laughs> grumpy nah. <You> know. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious um so when you're doing a power pack 
you have obviously there's a printing schedule that has to be adhered to a distribution schedule that has to be adhered to from the time you get the script to the time that the work is submitted by you to your husband are we talking two weeks or so three weeks you have to give him time to ink it and get it off how does that work uh, deadlines are a touchy subject <laughs> i know they are they were for me yeah i mean luckily on, like on the power pack job we're doing it's it's a five issue mini series um right up front the editor knew i had previous commitments um to the comic strip we do um teaching and uh so they've given us a lot of leeway and i i have to admit they even pushed the deadline for release back some for us so there is a very it's a very lenient schedule on on this it's not like back in the day where you had to produce a monthly book every month um that was just expected uh I, I think because of uh, the trade paperbacks, maybe there's a little more, a little more breathing room on the deadlines now. I, 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 from start to finish, pencils and inks on this, we probably have about three months, which is very, very lenient, very lenient. Yeah, that, that's um, really nice and generous, isn't it? Um, the the so comic strip is a different story. <laughs> Well, and I'll talk about that and, uh, and ask you about that in a minute. But let's let's look back at the kind of Herculean work ethic it must have taken for Jack Kirby to do his fourth world series at one time, right? So this would have been 1970, 71, something like that. He was doing 52 pages of New Gods, Forever People, Mr. Miracle, and then he was doing Jimmy Olsen at the same time. So you're looking at 200 plus pages of pencils to be, and, and four separate storylines to be completed in a month. Can you even fathom the kind of productivity that somebody like that had to have had at that time? Because we were having Neil Adams and and uh, some of those folks doing two books at a time as as well, which was hard enough. I can't even conceive of that. It's it's an incredible workload. No, I I I still think Jack Kirby was a mutant. I mean, <laughs> he was just, and I mean that in the best way possible. He was just, uh, I don't know, an evolutionary step ahead of us other mortal artists in his the, the the flow of creativity and and the work output and i don't i don't know when he slept um i mean that generation of artists especially the generation of artists who were working before the, the royalty program came into being oh, absolutely. Um, I, I i have so much respect because they were getting paid so little and they had to they made a living off the sheer volume of work that they did. And yet they were doing incredible work, just incredibly beautiful work. It was, there was a real commitment to the craft, to the story, to the product, to the business of making comics and entertainment itself. And when you were being paid a single page rate, and at that time, those artists were lucky if they were getting any of the work back, it was essentially yeah. work work for hire so when you shipped out that big sheet of uh crystal board it was gone and it may have stayed with the printers or been tossed because it was merely a commodity a means to an end uh for a printed product and so it, it's still really astonishing when you look at at the history of, of this industry that um people were able to earn a living and and to um and to find enjoyment in a system that was pretty repressive and it took until uh, comics became more of a favorable business model with with royalties and um and creator ownership over a, a particular product line that that would have been considered the luxury to 
people like Jack Kirby or, or some of the folks who were working at that time as well. John Buscema also had an extraordinary work ethic and was um, working very quickly. And I suspect, obviously, it, it's visible that there is a, an artistic visual shorthand that they were able to apply to their work that enabled them to work more quickly. Have you found that visual shorthand for yourself? Because Lord knows I haven't found it for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the things you post where you're like, here's a sketch. And I'm like, that's it. What? What are you talking about? What did it take you a week to do this sketch? <laughs> no, well, I'm pretty good at the sketching, but you know, it's the, the finished stuff that's incredibly hard. Um, I mean, that's, that's part of the, the business, that's part of the artistry that, you know, develop the look of comics is the, sh the shorthand. And I, I think that the, the shorthand is also one of the great artistic strengths. You know, you're finding, you, you have, it's true because of the deadline, before, because of the, you know, the production an artist is, is expected to be capable of, you do have to find very direct ways to say what you want to say. Say it, put it down, move on, move on. But so something very economic in its in its design, a real economy of design. Right. Um, and you know, the artists who are really successful about that, I, I think that takes place in the storytelling stage stage. I think they find a way to get across pretty complex things in simple ways. And I think to average viewer, they might look at comic books and think, well, this is, this is really simple. This is really simplified. It's not sophisticated, but, but it is, it is sophisticated. And I, I, I remember once when I was first starting out, I had a really, really hard time meeting my deadlines and I was so slow and it was really difficult. And I, I said to um, Walt Simonson, Louise Simonson's husband, uh, they, would, they were so good to us. They would, you know, take us out to dinner. And this was when we had, you know, we were eating a lot of, you know, Kraft macaroni and cheese. And I said to Walt, who was so fast, I said, how, how do you work so quickly? How do you get this done so fast? He said, well, I just, I know what not to draw. Uh, was that a good tip? To draw. And it, at the time, I was like, huh? <laughs> you know, but later when I thought about it, it's brilliant. You, you have to pare a scene down to its essence. What, what is the one thing? What is the big thing? What is the big moment you're trying to get, to get across? And what's going to serve that? And what's going to detract from that, that emphasis? Um, and you figure those things out in that first initial thumbnail in the storytelling. Yeah, and it's really very interesting to me. So I like to show students, um, and I don't teach sequential art, I do teach illustration. Uh, and I show pages, early pages from Mike Mignola when he was working, coming up in the DC doing the Batman series versus a pretty, contemporary Hellboy piece. Mm -hmm. And you look at that early Batman and you see that it's much more fleshed out. It's, uh, it, there's more going on there. He was younger. And, and then with a Hellboy page from the late 2000s, you can see that he has created a shorthand of line that is very limited that enables him to move on really really quickly and yet it has a very specific poignant style to it that's that's the real challenge isn't it and um i imagine that with your characterizations uh, and the things that you draw you've had to do the same sort of thing uh at first that's got to be a lot of work to figure out what that 
is to make it to a, a simple page component. Um, can you talk a little bit about working on a daily strip? It's, you work with comics, comic books, different kind of pacing, different kind of rhythm. Now you're working with a syndicate and you're working on a daily and you've done dailies for a long time. What is that like? How do you, how do you go about that day? How much of a lead time do you have? Never Super enough. Never enough. <laughs> yeah. um, it's different. It's, it's the same, but different. Uh, I, my, my husband and I, we did um, Brenda Starr for 15 years. And now we've been doing the Mary Work comic strip for, I think, four years? Five years. I can't remember. <laughs> um, and it's, it's still storytelling. It's still, you know, sequential art. It's still, um, you know, figuring out the best way to tell the story. How are you going to show the scene? Camera angles, camera shots. What are you going to emphasize? Um, it's all those same sort of questions, but it's also much more limiting. Um, a comic book, you have this um, 11 by 17 board with like a 10 by 15 live area. And you can pretty much divide that up any way you see fit to, to serve the story. Um, as far as panel sizes, shapes, number of panels, that's up to you. Newspaper strips, the format is pretty much set in stone. You can't suddenly decide to have a vertical panel going the length of the strip. You can't do that uh, because of the, the newspaper printing process and the way newspapers will sometimes rearrange the panels or leave the first tier of panels out. So you have a very limited space, um, very limited number, uh, shape, size of panels. And also there's a lot more repetition. The stories generally advance on the Sundays. And then the, the dailies, which is the Monday through Saturday strips, just sort of expand on what was done on the Sunday because there are some people who don't read the dailies and you should be able to keep up with a strip based on what you read in the Sunday. So there's a lot of repetition. It's um, the formatting is very limited. Um, and the, the deadlines are relentless, relentless. Uh, so. so how far in advance are you working? So if the, the piece that is in the paper today. Um, I, think we're, I think we're about uh, six weeks ahead on the dailies. No, six weeks ahead. I think we're six weeks ahead on the Sunday page. And uh, four or five weeks ahead on the daily strips. And even that is cutting it a little, a little close. Um, but I think most comic strip artists would tell you that you can never have enough lead time. Sure, and that's, um, that's really fascinating for me because in our exhibition, we have many, many examples of beautiful dailies and Sunday strips from from the time in which you know a prince valiant or a tarzan and burn hogarth tarzan was a full page right. and you had the ecology to tell a wide ranging story that would lead into something more subsequent but and even the in the daily panels you had five panels or something like that. Well, the real estate in the newspapers for comics these days are much more abbreviated. I don't know, what are your, what are your Sunday panels limited to in your dailies? I've seen dailies that are what, three panels? I have two. Two? Two. Um, hey. Brenda, Brenda Starr had three, Mary Worth has two. On um, the Sundays that I do have uh, seven panels, but the first two always have to be um, throwaway panels because 
not all newspapers will print those first two panels. So whatever you do in the first two can't be essential to the story. And tell me more about that. So what would uh, the first two be? Would it be a recap of what happened during the week or? Uh, no, it, it, will, it will be all, you know, part of one, one scene um, that it might just be uh, maybe, an, I tend to do an exterior shot, kind of an establishing shot in the first panel. And then the second panel will be the close up of a character saying something. But, um, but that's not sort of lead into the, the rest of the, the strip. Um, but it's, and the writer, you know, the, the writer has to be a part of this as well. The, whatever the writer puts in those first two panels, it can't be, you know, a big moment, a big twist, a big, you know, <laughs> Exposed or anything because the papers might just leave it out. Yeah, <laughs> that would uh, mess with the story arc, certainly, yeah. wouldn't it? Uh, well, June, did you ever have the opportunity to meet and have a conversation with any of the really great artists in the industry? Somebody like Joe Kubert or or Jack Kirby or John Buscema, did you ever have an oh, opportunity yeah. to sit down and talk with them, talk shop? Um, I'm really curious, particularly somebody like Kubert who uh, started in comics when he was what? He did his first professional work at 13, 14 yeah. years old. Yeah. Um, did you ever have occasion to, to talk shop with him? Uh, I, I did. I mean, I, I taught at the, the Joe Kubert School for, for two years, um, two days a week. I was just part time. And on Tuesdays, um, well, at, at that school, during lunch break, the teachers would all go to like the, the break room and have lunch together. And Joe, on Tuesdays, Joe would, was teaching and he would come in and have lunch with us. And um, as far as talking shop, not really. What I did get to do was he had um, he had his home studio, but he also had a studio at the school. And sometimes when you know the school day was done, I was done with my classes. I could knock on the door and go in there and see what was on his drawing board, which must have been a treat. And what surprised me was how finished his pencils were because he always, almost always inked himself. And he has such, you know, the, the, the sense of spontaneity and great gestural quality in his work and his inks. There's nothing, you know, over thought about it. Um, that I always assumed that he really didn't put much down in the pencils, but there was a lot more than you'd think. I mean, there was enough there in, his, in the pencil stage that he could have handed it to somebody else to finish. Um, I guess the, the words of wisdom that, that stuck with me the most um, were, let's see, how'd it go? It, it was so simple and brilliant. Let's see, Joe, Joe once said, well, if it looks right, it probably is. And if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't. And it's like, <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> that's all you need to know. <laughs> uh. That's so funny. And right, that's a whole, that's another story, but I thought that was pretty good. Well, we're very fortunate to, to have a piece of his in the exhibition as well. Something from, I think, Star Spangled War Stories, but it, it was a character who became uh, enemy ace. So it's one of those oh, World wow. War I flying, uh, uh, flying ace stories. It's a beautiful one page. And, and the economy of his mark making was really brilliant. He, he was a great draftsman and again had this wonderful shorthand and style that was instantly identifiable as Joe Kubert, right? And what a, what a privilege it, it must have been to have met him and to have worked uh, in an environment in which he was a part and as well as others in this industry. You've had a very fascinating career. 
Um, I'm so grateful to you for having spent last semester working with a few of our students. And, you know, I can't wait to get you back and, yeah, and teach them teaching with us at KSU again. You've been a real gift to our program. And um, June, thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm so privileged that you um, have a piece exhibited in, in the Ninth Art, and um, I look forward to chatting with you again. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a great weekend. You too.